I was the Globe's Moscow bureau chief. When I turned on CNN, saw uh, smoke coming from the towers. I got an email from my mom saying, your father was on the first plane. As with everybody else, as the day wore on and we all saw what the real magnitude and meaning of this was, you know, it became everything suddenly, you know, not just a question of getting back to my family, but also what was going to change in the world. And I had a feeling that sooner or later I might be covering it. When you're covering a war, you you try to get information as you can. You talk to other reporters, you talk to people on the ground, you try to get a sense of where you can go, what you can do, what's happening, so that you don't just walk into some place and get killed. But at a certain point, what you sort of do is walk into some place and see what's up. So we get out to the front line, somebody comes up, who are you? And we say, who are you? We write down a name, and that's Abdul Khanon. His younger brother had been conscripted and forced to fight with the Taliban. I mean, he was a, he had a family that was all decimated. Most of his family was under Taliban, you know, living in a place that was under Taliban control. So I'm looking at this guy and all the other people, they'd all suffered losses. They'd all, you know, they were trying to fight this war at the same time as they were all grieving. And my story kind of sort of fit right in. I didn't stick out in Afghanistan. Where I'd started my trip in 2001, that road, a lot of it is considered a no-go zone for Westerners. So to do that, I basically put on Afghan clothes, um, sat in the back, kept my mouth shut. I remembered the reception that we had in 2001. First of all, nobody had seen Americans ever. So we were an object of curiosity. And second of all, we were, you know, from the country that had come in to deliver people from the Taliban, the regime they loathed. Where's everybody at? The Taliban came back. They've gotten stronger. They've spread back to the north where everybody hated them. I don't know how many people told me, you know, the Americans got rid of the Taliban in one month in 2001. Why is it taking them so long now? As far as our effort is going right now, we've definitely transferred, at least up here in the north, we've transferred more into an, an advisory role with the police just so they're able to to sustain themselves, operate alone, do that little bit of development to get that, that government influence out through, I mean, you open up the roads, you're able to get influence, develop it out, more infrastructure will follow as we kind of continue to develop up here. When we find things that need to be improved, uh, we document it, put it in PowerPoint presentations, and figure out solutions on how we can uh, use the government to help fix uh, the instability in the, the region. They have a great idea, they have a great strategy, get the Afghans to learn how to make these systems work on their own. Security and control of the government and basic services to Afghans so that they can leave. But they're doing it in 2011. Uh, it, a lot of this stuff could have been done a lot easier in 2002. I didn't talk to any Afghans who said, we want the United States to leave. In fact, a lot of people told me, if the United States leaves tomorrow, the Taliban will take over the entire country. We don't want, want that. And when you talk to the Americans who, you know, they're in the situation where they're being asked right now, under the circumstances, bad roads, no services, threat of attacks, suicide bombs. Uh, they're being asked to try to foster civil society which is an amazing complicated task. This has got to be the most difficult thing in the world. So where we are now, those are the beginning of the Hindu Kush mountains. And we're looking down at the plain, and they're going to show us where the Taliban-controlled villages across the river. 
surrounding area, Balkh province, is slowly becoming more and more under the influence of the Taliban or of other armed militant groups. Okay, so it's, it's right where that, um, I see it, right where the tall mountain is, in, is yeah. behind it. And, and you hear about these towns basically falling to the Taliban, this kind of quiet conquest. They're related, they know each other, but that town, hard times, economic troubles, probably are affiliated with the Taliban. Now these guys look across the river, see the Taliban, you know, their lives are hard, they don't want the Taliban, the other side, let them in. If it came to it, they would defend themselves, and that's where it all starts. Introduce yourself. I'm Sarwar. And the last time I saw you, you were with your brother Hanon. Uh, and you both had come back from fighting. First we found Abdul Hanon's home, where we met his brother, Hulam Sahar, who had fought for the Taliban. And through him, we got the cell phones of Abdul Hanon. He was the one I'd been trying to find. Uh, I've been trying to get him, and it was very difficult to track him down, even with the cell phones, just because he had left his hometown. <laughs> when I finally saw him, it sort of was the culmination of, of that whole effort that had started way back in May. Hey, let's go to Afghanistan and see what happens, see if I can track down these people. We last saw each other in 2001 at his house. He was very emotional about it. He'd gotten older, obviously, heavier still wore the same hat that he'd been wearing. It was a lot lighter because he you know, washes it every time, that flat pancake hat. What are you, what are you doing here? What are you doing in Kabul? <laughs> he expected so much. He had fought for so long. He wasn't fighting anymore. He wanted a better life, and the one he had wasn't as great. He wasn't profiting in any of the sort of new business. And the people he had tried so hard to defeat were back. And um, he was telling me that he's really depressed that this is the way it's come to. He was really disheartened, very nervous. He said, basically said, I worry that they're going to kill me. As I was flying away from Afghanistan after meeting him, I took away that the way these rebellions end is that the average Afghan guy realizes it's easier and better to make a life being part of society than fighting it. And if you can create those conditions so that Farmer X, instead of taking $100 from the Taliban to lay roadside bombs, instead feels like he can grow his food, sell it at market, make a decent living for himself, have children and prosper, then you end the insurgency. Uh, it's hard to do that at the point of the gun, but at the same time in Afghanistan, the only way it's going to happen is if uh, the people who have the guns make sure that that's the goal and do everything to make it happen. Americans are trying to do that now.